All right. I warned you not to listen to that, Gets My Goat. Now look at you. All right, everybody. Hi, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And uh, this gets my goat. <laughs> Does it? Yeah, we were uh, mandated. Every, everybody told us to take the bullet for them. Should what do you I, think about that? I, I meant to look. I, I asked. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to talk about Suicide Squad right now. And, and I'm sure we will spoil Suicide Squad if that's possible. But I posted on Facebook that, you know, the reviews have not been kind to this movie. Do y'all still want us to go see it? And then I forgot to look and see what people said. But they here we are, so I'm assuming. They all said, yeah, take that bullet. Watch the bad movie for me so I don't have to. Is that what they said? Mostly, yeah. It's They're very, just like, yes, you can generous. be our sacrificial lambs. Okay. We're happy for you to do that for us. We've got the best fans. We I, do. Escape they really love artists. us. Fans wouldn't <laughs> do that. They go, eh. So, um, shoot, I don't know where to begin. Sorry, lowered ahead. expectations. We've done a couple of lowered expectations episodes, but yeah, nothing could lower my expectations like a what was it, twenty three percent Rotten Tomatoes? Oh, is that how bad it was? Well, it was at thirty, like right before it came out, when the DC fans were petitioning that RottenTomatoes dot com be removed. Because they uh, there was a bias, and uh, then it went down to twenty seven percent, and then uh, sometime around last time I looked, it was at twenty three. Twenty three. That is really really low. That does beat out Ice Age Part whatever we're on ten plus. They're they're doing imaginary numbers now by a little bit. But I can't think of anything else that's scored so low. Well, <laughs> Batman v Superman colon Dawn of Justice. That one is lower than 23? I think it was 22 or 23 <laughs> right there. So, so it's so even. They're, they're neck even. and neck. Yeah, that was, last I looked, they were right there. And so uh, part of me was just like, well, I, if it's that bad, guys, do we... Do we, do we have need, to? Yeah. Um, Come on, Mom. But you had Five said... Five more minutes. In fact, you said recently when we saw Finding Dory that the best thing you can do before going to a movie is expect that it's not going to be good. Because something opens up in your heart or your head or your, your eyes. It might be the butthole <laughs> that allows you to enjoy something you might not otherwise have enjoyed. Yeah, when you expect it to really, really suck. If it doesn't really, really suck, then that's, you know, a bonus. It's a plus. So, we both kind of were expecting something not good. Something really, really awful. And, uh... For me, it throws into question what Rotten Tomatoes is. Because, yeah, I'm just going to... I'm not going to bury the lead. This wasn't a bad movie at all. I didn't think. I, I... I kept waiting for it to turn to shit. Yeah, I... I, I was like, okay, guys, I can see. And, and there would be a flaw, and I'd be like, okay, here it is. This is going to be the beginning. It's going to be a domino effect. Uh-huh. Uh, and then, you know, one domino would fall, and the others would stay. And then, you know, a little while later, oh, oh there goes another domino. That was it? Just one domino? And, yeah, the movie ended, and I was like, oh, this is a 23? Again, I just yeah, it makes me wonder. I'm in a, I'm in a topsy turvy world. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, though. Like, uh, uh, need I remind you that the movie that you despised, Finding Dory, has a 94 on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, sometimes yeah. that happens, you know. The critics, I mean, that's who puts these scores up. The critic, they take the overall, you know, score of the critics and they just put it up there. And critics uh, sometimes have a different sensibility than. Uh, your average Joe? I guess, but which are we? I don't know. I mean, essentially, we were tasked by the fans of of our show to watch this movie. And does that not make us critics? Because <laughs> they wanted to hear what we had to say. And I've heard people say, well, you guys liked so something. I, I guess I'm going to go see it. And I don't know. Anyway, I wonder if we have a bias, though, because... Obviously, we're here. We we review only some movies. 
We're not going to every film and saying, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, Love and Friendship, which, by the way, has a 100 on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, that was really good. Love and Friendship. I, uh, uh, I really highly recommend that. Because, you know, the people who want to know whether the new Jane Austen movie is good or not, they're not coming to our show to <laughs> see what we thought of it. We only go and see the movies that fit into our niche, into our interests, and we talk about those, which is kind of sad when it comes down to it, because I, that's about all I see. I don't see anything else. I mean, I'm not like you. You watch movies like crazy. Well, I, um, I try to. I, it's hard. And I'm because sure you... people won't go with me, and that's sad. <laughs> right. And I'm sure you watch less movies than you used to, and it just kind of happens uh, as you get older and you have more responsibilities and you have et cetera. That just happens. It's hard unless, I don't know, it's your job or something like that. You're not going to go and see more than 100 movies a year uh, like you used to. But, you know, you have to be more discriminatory and you know what things turn you on. You know, you're not into the... Uh, Midget porn, you're more into the uh, cream pie. <laughs> okay, hey, uh, this this might be an explicit episode. I, I don't know. Again, oh, oh yeah, if you've we got toddlers have, in the car. Might have to put an explicit warning on it. Sorry, I was just going down the route of what turns you on. No, you you know me very well. So, anyways, you're you know you're only going to be into certain things, so you're not going to spend your time on the other things and. I wonder if that makes a bias for us. I mean, hey, it's a whole bunch of superheroes or supervillains. And yeah, how much does that bias things? I don't know. Is it a, Do we find it cool because of that? Because I... I also did not think that this was a terrible movie. There was things wrong with it, but I would not put it at a 23. And I know that's not the way the score works it's not like it's everybody gave it a 23 percent it's but isn't it essentially that it was it got a 23 out of 100 percent positive review yeah people gave it a yay or nay and it just turns out that you know more were nay than yay i guess to that percentage i don't know what that means exactly because i think we talked about that wait, wait let's be silent for just a minute the uh, Frame fires of wider. hell have opened up here. Once That's what again. that uh, thing was over there—a train. Okay. We talked about this when we did Finding Dory. You know what makes it a positive and what makes it a negative? Because most people don't say, oh, "I give it four out of five stars," or "I give it two thumbs up." Uh, you know, they just say, "Here are the positives and here are the negatives about the movie." And somebody, I think, at Rotten Tomatoes says, "Okay." Well, there was more positives than negatives, so this is a positive review. And then somebody else says, okay, there was more negatives, so this one's a negative review. But yeah, in the end, I didn't, I didn't dislike this film. Uh, I was waiting for stuff, and yeah, there were, there were flaws, there were things that I didn't like. But there was a lot of good stuff to this one. You know, when I saw, oh, 23, I, okay, it's, it's the standard DC movie where it's so grim and awful that you just can't be, you can't walk away feeling anything but, you know, beat down and in the dumps. Um, I didn't feel that way with this one. Okay, and, and I didn't either. Um, you said that I despised Finding Dory. I, I don't think I despised it, but I certainly found more wrong with Finding Dory than I will with Suicide Squad. Not to say that Suicide Squad's a better movie than Finding Dory, but look at what we were measuring Finding Dory against. Right. That is true, and, I mean, when you're measuring it against... But the, the weird thing is, I think Finding Nemo is a 93. Okay, now that's friggin' and Finding bullshit. Dory is a 94. Okay, again, Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> maybe the DC fans are right. Maybe it, they need to be burned to the ground. But... We, we go to our fair share of movies, and I always want to arrive in time for the trailers. Because the trailers are giving you a glimpse of what's coming in the future and what you might want to see or what you can get excited about. And, yeah, there wasn't a lot on this one where I was just like, oh, yeah, that looks good. But I remember the first time I saw the Suicide Squad trailer. The <laughs> first one, the uh, not the Ballroom Blitz, but I guess 
this the uh, the Bohemian Rhapsody one. Yes. It was a wonderful trailer, and it looked so much fun. And I thought, wow, why well, I, I want to see this. Whereas before, I was just like, well, I'm not going to see Batman v Superman, and Suicide Squad is a sequel to that, isn't it? So I'm not going to go see that either. And that trailer won me over. And so I, I just, yeah, I, I need to say a little bit about that. That marketing can make a big difference, especially in how, in, in what expectations you have going into the movie. And I feel like that trailer that we saw promised the movie that we saw. Yeah. So when other people said that this movie was crap or really, really dour or miserable or, or whatever they were saying, I wonder what they thought of that trailer. I wouldn't be surprised if the Batman v Superman movie was entirely faithful to its trailer. And when I saw that, I was just like, oh, geez. Grim and gray and violent and dark and depressing. And you know what? There's no light in the world at all. Oh, wait, wait. There's a pretty lady with some kind of shield and... Oh, she's gone. Over. The end. Yeah, we, we never did see it to know. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny right off the top of this show... They give a, give you a nice spoiler to uh, <laughs> Batman v Superman, which uh, you had to we, have known, right? Yeah, I knew it by now, but we never saw it. And I would think, I mean, I guess this is DC Universe, so you know we we gotta expect them to treat things the same way that they do uh, with Marvel, where each one is a sequel to the last one, sort of. Uh, I didn't consider this one as a sequel to Batman vs. Superman, more like a side one. Like, you know, I don't Ant-Man is not going to spoil stuff for the Justice League. But if you didn't know what happened in Batman, it's only been six months, you know? You don't expect the sequel to come out the same year. I don't know. It was, it was an interesting thing. But watch out for that. If you're going to go see this and you haven't seen Batman vs. Superman and you mean to, and the ending of it hasn't already been spoiled for you, Watch it first, I guess. Not that I want to tell somebody to watch that because I think it's surely crap and I refuse to watch it, but it's spoiled, so there's that. We talked when that movie came out about hypocrisy and whether I would be a hypocrite. I don't know that you would be a hypocrite if you went to see Batman v Superman. But I certainly felt like I was morally obligated to make a stand <laughs> and say, you know what, I said I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to do it and you can call me names or whatever you want but I'm not going to do it and I didn't feel that way about Suicide Squad in fact on that episode where we talked about why we weren't reviewing Batman v Superman I said you know the jury's still out on Suicide Squad and if I hear good things I'll go see that but I, I heard see a good trailer I heard only bad things and yet <laughs> we still went and saw it and I don't regret it I I had a good time and and I don't know if it's because of the lowered expectations or because I'm easy to please. I, I, I really don't know what it is. Because there were a couple of moments where it just did, plain didn't work in this movie. And I thought, am I going to give that a pass or am I going to remember that and say, okay, that sucked. And I didn't. I had always go, eh, all right, well, that line wasn't very good. Yeah, there, I, I, I don't know if we want to talk about the flaws and strengths of the movie already. Maybe we should. But something that you and I noticed at the very, very beginning <laughs> is the people that worked the hardest on this movie seem to be those music supervisors <laughs> that go out and they get music rights for pop songs or, you know. Yeah, they were going off on it. They had like a different theme song for each stinking character, each one as they introduced him. Here's this guy and he's like this. And then... Dude, 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 looking out my back door starts playing. And then, uh, you know. Sympathy for the devil plays. Yeah, they kept playing one after the other you after the own other. own me. Before we were through the first 20 minutes of the show, I think we'd been through 10 different songs. And they just, they, they kept coming. And it was weird, actually, when you heard the first, like, you know, score come in and they start playing a score and it's just like wow that's weird that they bothered to do a score I would have thought that they would you know come up with some song you know it would be like Iron Man where basically his theme song is shoot the thrill 
by ACDC. And they, I think they had an ACDC song in there, too. Yeah, they had Dirty Deeds. Yeah, there, there you too. go. Uh, so, yeah, I just figured they'd just pick one. I don't know. Uh, I think they had Spirit in the Sky, too, didn't they? They did. And that's the Guardians of the Galaxy theme. I mean, I can't believe they stole that. It's not even in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> what was the song? Just a tiny little aside. The song started to play, and it was the first one I hadn't recognized. And you said, this is a cover of the worst song ever made. Oh. I didn't recognize it. What was that? <laughs> so, it, it wasn't, I mean, I guess it kind of or was, was a it, cover. Or was they were sampling them? They were, they were using the chorus for it. Uh, so there's this song from the 80s. I, I think I actually played it for you one time. And I didn't recognize it. Was it was called... Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but anyways, the chorus goes, I saw you walking in the rain. And <laughs> it's by this guy whose name is Oren Jones. But it was Oren, parentheses, Juice Jones <laughs> was this guy's name. And it was such a cheesy song. It's it's fun, but yeah, it's I saw you, and then they have somebody go and him, and him, <laughs> walking in the rain. Okay, I remember you telling me this whole story, and, and you and know I. this song from beginning to end. And again, the only time I've ever heard it is when you told me this story the first time. <laughs> yeah, it was a song from the '80s. And, uh, him. and him. Yeah, I remember it playing on the radio and stuff like that. It was one of those weird songs that uh, you hear. I don't know. I'm sure there's a bunch of random songs like that, that people know for some reason. But yeah, there was, <laughs> there was a rap song, and then that was like the chorus. Right. They, they and it wasn't, that, or it, was it covered? It wasn't sampled. Yeah, somebody else was singing the hook. It wasn't like Orange Juice Jones <laughs> doing this song. He, he cost too much. The yeah. Rolling Stones they could afford, but... <laughs> Uh, no, I'm sure they just didn't want to go back to that. You know, somebody else had, you know, used that hook for their song. And they're like, that's a cool song. One of those, you know, how, how it is with rap music. There's so many songs where you hear it and you're like, Why did they you just... didn't even know that song that they took. And then one day you hear the original song. You're like, oh my gosh, this disco song is actually the track that goes behind the Puff Daddy song. I, oh my gosh, I didn't even know. So there were tons. The songs just kept coming and coming and coming. And yeah, I was surprised that they had a Suicide Squad score theme. that They played it a couple of times. Like They got to a certain point, and then they're like, all right, that's it with the pop. We're out of money. No more rights fees. We're out of money. We could only afford to do two more songs, and Queen Bohemian Rhapsody is already spoken for. So one more song, and then we're going to do... Okay, Eminem. Yeah. All right. The end. Now, now we're all full, but the, everything needs to be taken in moderation, kids. You know, special effects are good, but when you get a gajillion special effects, or explosions are good, but when you get way too many explosions, they stop meaning anything. They start to just be, oh, more expl Okay, yeah, oh, guess what? That's gonna, yeah. okay, that exploded too. And just yeah, the, the visual overload. The needle drops, point. which are what the, our, Film in production the, professor used to call yeah. anytime in a script it designates this song bad moon plays rising here. plays during the scene, but those need to be taken in moderation as well, and because it dilutes the power of those when every two and a half minutes you get another song. Was it bad moon rising? That must have been the one. That no, played. no, not I just out my back door. No, it was out my back door. Oh, I was? was just using Bad Moon oh, okay. Rising as an example. I was just thinking, Bad Moon Rising makes a lot more sense for these characters. I must have remembered it wrong. Anyways, yeah, they definitely overdid it. I mean, it's... Uh, like, for example... I mean, you can... I think what they were going for here... And it worked similarly uh, with the trailers as well... Was the Guardians of the Galaxy thing. Guardians of the Galaxy... Went with these pop songs... And they used them in the trailer, and everybody went, oh my gosh, this this looks really good. They have this weird song about, uh, The you know. Uga Chaka. Yeah, Uga Chaka song. <laughs> they have this song that's so silly, and oh my gosh, this looks like it's going to be great, and it's really funny and quirky. They went for that. Plus, Guardians of the Galaxy sold a ton of soundtrack albums. Right, right. And nobody sells soundtrack albums anymore. Yeah, that's a thing that doesn't happen very often. 
and yeah, they 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 were going for that. And Guardians of the Galaxy did did do the same thing. They had a lot of songs in Guardians of the Galaxy, but they used them more sparingly. And when they used them, it wasn't just like, "Here's the song. We'll play you thirty seconds of it, and now okay, we're done. Here's another song. Thirty seconds. Okay, we're done of that. Thirty. You know, they were they were just coming at you really fast. And it was it, too much, right? Yeah, it was just too much. It was kind of annoying. It's like you were saying with the too many explosions. This was taxing on the ears. We're just like, oh, yeah, that's a cool song. Oh, that's a cool... Okay, that... that I mean, that's a cool song, but... Oh, okay, there's... You, know, uh, you don't have to use, like... Uh, okay, there's another one. You know? It was kind of like tattoos in this movie. <laughs> yeah, there was Somebody a lot of those, too. who likes tattoos... I'm going to say it was David Ayer... Really likes tattoos, guys. <laughs> so basically, the premise of Suicide Squad is you take a bunch of villains and you put them on a team, and they're sort of forced to work together. Um, and they call them the Suicide Squad because they're expendable. They are sent on this mission where it's unlikely that they will survive, and uh, it's okay because they're all bad guys. And if we lose them, better them than us. Uh, Suicide Squad's been a comic series for a long time. They did it on the Arrow television series, and uh, it works. There were a lot of characters here, though, and and I found it admirable that they were trying to explain who everybody was and give them all a tiny bit of backstory and uh, explanation of what their power set or their skill set was. And, you know, we got a bunch of flashbacks, and what do you call it when... The information comes up on the screen. Yeah, the, the graphics would pop up and say, this, 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 way too fast to read. You could read some of it, but mostly I just ignored it all. Other than maybe, like, the names, if they were... Because there was a fair... I mean, these weren't all A-list villains. I mean, one guy was, like, a boomerang thrower. Captain Boomerang is a uh, Flash villain. Uh, and another guy could climb. Yes. <laughs> these, these. I mean, some of these guys felt like they belonged on uh, the Mystery Men instead of like an actual uh, thing. It's just like the Bowler and uh, the Digger. Anyways, yeah, some of them were, and, and obviously the uh, spoiler alert. Stop here if you don't want to hear this. The climber, climber guy was more expendable than others. His name was Slipknot. He was just there to uh, to demonstrate that the bombs in their head was real. Yeah, we get four or five backstories and introduction to characters, proper introductions, with like, you know, this is how they got captured and this is who they were before. And then right before the, the action, the main action set piece begins, we're introduced to three more. Yeah, they just throw them in. And it's like, oh, wow, now there's a lot, dude. Um... And yeah, it was for that reason. We had a couple of disposable characters so that you know that there is danger, so that you know that there is... Yeah, we had red shirts basically yeah. thrown in, which was kind of a dead giveaway, I guess. I mean, I should have totally expected, and I kind of did totally expect that that, was, that dude was dead. Uh, but I didn't want him to be. I kind of liked him more than some of the other characters <laughs> that actually stayed, which was kind of a bummer. <laughs> For some reason, it felt like overkill to me the way they introduced everybody. I think I would elaborate. Uh, her sitting down, and be like, "Here's the dossiers on all these guys. This guy does this, and then we see the backstory, and he's got a kid, and he, you know, I, 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 I would have liked it. It felt like, I, I guess, the you know, in fiction, when you're writing, to, uh, it, I guess it's kind of one of the sins that you can do. Although sometimes it's what you do. I don't know. I've seen plenty of writers that are very... Like John Grisham, I've been listening to one of his books, and he's got plenty info dumps going on. But that's what this felt like. It was info dump time. It's like, here is exposition, 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 exposition. You know, they just kind of like threw it at you one after the other, after the other, after the other. When I... I think I would have liked it a little better had they just worked that in through the, you know, the course of the story. We find out that Deadshot has a daughter and 
you know, Batman caught him right in front of her, and the only reason he didn't shoot Batman is because his daughter blocked him, et cetera, et cetera. Some of that stuff was worked in, like Katana's thing, where they just threw in a quick flashback, although that was a jarring flashback, if you ask me, the way they did her backstory. She's like, hi, everybody, I'm Katana. And then it was like, oh, and I was just killing this guy. And then it's right back. Uh, I don't know. They, you, well, they, 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 they tried to do it both ways, though. You get stuff like Katana's origin... And then, yeah, you get the briefing origins as well. Well, it's just that um, they didn't introduce it, you know what I'm saying? Like, the other ones, they're like, there's this and there's this, and they've got somebody who kind of feeds it to you, and then the other, and then Katana walks in, and it's just like, smack, across the face. Okay, move on. You know, they, she just walks in, then here's the backstory, then uh, moving on. Well, um, they had a lot of characters to do that they with. They did. And I, I, I don't know how you get around that yeah um, it's hard i mean yeah for somebody like harley or deadshot you can give them their own sequence but i don't i think we would have gotten really tired if rick flag had had his own sequence and captain Bo- boomerang had had his own sequence and then enchantress had i guess she still had her own sequence but, yeah well but then, enchantress slash rick flag kind of had their own sequence they were sort of a pair I don't know. But yeah, they, these was... characters are so unknown. That's true. That you had to do that. I mean, Batman really is the only character where they didn't feel the need to ever say that's who that is. Well, Joker too, but, you know. But they spent a lot of time on Harley, who's one of the better known. Probably, I don't know. I would say, other than the Joker and Batman, Harley Quinn was the most well-known villain that they had in the group. That's true. And Deadshot, we only know because they made him a big deal and gave you a lot of backstory. I mean, I don't know him otherwise. And yeah, then, you know, the Captain Boomerang and Mr. Climber, you know, these guys. <laughs> Diablo, Killer Croc. Yeah. Um, who am I missing? Oh, I guess Killer Croc, I know. I knew Killer... Well, did I trying to think if I knew Killer Croc before I knew Harley Quinn. Probably not, I guess, now that I, now that I come to it. But yeah, they're, they're super B-list villains. Bug-Eyed Bandit would have been fine in that group. So yeah, I guess it takes a lot of exposition. And it's a huge group of people. But I don't know, I, I, I would have liked it better if it was more... Streamlined. Artfully woven in. Oh, art. okay. Instead of just info dump. Okay, here's another info dump. Uh, something like that. I don't know. We did get a couple of those. Like, there's a moment toward the end of the film where you get another flashback to Harley. Yeah. Back. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And I don't know if it would have worked better to do that throughout the film and give you more... They sort of tried to do do it a bunch of different ways. I I feel like they tried. This park is getting louder. Yeah. I, Should we I go get in the car? I can't help but feel like they're doing it on purpose. Is it just me? I, do I hate kids that much, or are they doing <laughs> it on purpose? No, I think they're just using the park. Yeah. I say we go get in the car, though. These kids are playing, like, freeze tag, or I don't know what the heck, tag... Okay. They're playing Smear the Queer. <laughs> oh, wow. It's been a while since I lost that game. <laughs> I say we go get in the car. Let's do it okay. before it gets too loud. Uh, okay, it's starting to sound like we didn't like this movie, so I'm going to hold my criticisms to one more thing. Okay. I don't know if it's the same one more thing that you I'm might sure want to do, but... It, but uh, my other criticism is just, uh, and this is something that happens a lot in superhero films. So they have the big, big baddie, right? Shoot, it is the same thing. And she was such a mustache twirling, uh, cookie cutter, just kind of lame 
big baddie. You know what I mean? She. Just, I do know what you mean. All of her lines were so like, oh, I will take over the world. And she was, uh, she very much was like Ultron or General Zod from the uh, Man of Steel movie or, you know, a lot of the other films. The, the big, I mean, I guess she was seemed pretty powerful, but her motivations and her... She was just a cardboard cutout that we need something really bad to be there. And here you go. And it, it seemed like they tried to do a little something to, uh, you know, give her somewhat of a story because they had that thing where... He, she was would switch places with the with the woman that ran. I wanted to call him Randall Flag. His name is something else. Flag, right? Rick Flag. Rick Flag. Which, by the way, I didn't like Rick Flag. I don't know if you didn't like him, but I didn't like him. You Anyways, didn't like the actor, or you didn't? I didn't. Yeah, I didn't like the actor that played him much. He seemed like he should be playing a a trucker, a, yeah. a guy that pumps gas at it. Right. Yeah, some... some hillbilly <laughs> gas station. Yeah, a hillbilly that just came down out of the woods. Uh, maybe he was. Maybe that's how he got into the National Guard <laughs> or whatever. And um, But anyways, yeah, they tried to give her, you know, that, that little bit, some kind of an twist or an element but but it's abandoned early on or yeah. about the midway part of the movie and it never comes up again like i thought it would have been cool if somehow she was inside fighting to get out kind of a thing like there was a conflict within the character well maybe if the scientist character had emerged in just long enough to help our heroes defeat the being that had taken yeah them. or you know she kept a dark fighting Phoenix kind of thing where yeah. it's like Jean Grey emerges just long enough to say do this I or, don't want to be this thing yeah or whatever just yeah something like that you know if she'd come out or maybe just Rick Flagg comes out and and the character can't just immediately kill him you know that she had. You know, the the love that what's inside her feels causes her uh, to not just strike immediately or to send her brother to kill or whatever. I don't know. It was it was just too cookie cutter for me to to re really get invested in. See, that's interesting because I I thought for sure you would say something totally different. But this, they introduced that enchantress character early, early on, and I thought she had such a cool design of like almost being completely black, and her eyes had embers in them or whatever. And then she emerges as like the major villain, and she just looked stupid. I, I don't know. I, I okay. A, they hired a, a model rather than an actress to play her, and I understand why you do that. But there were times I was just like. <sighs> This is just not working, and I, I, my inclination was to blame the actress, but there's got to be a lot of blame to go around. It just, yeah, it didn't, yeah, didn't work. Yeah, like I think Hayden Christensen and Jake Lloyd get a little more blame than they deserve as well, because sometimes it's uh, people above them that are in charge that deserve uh, the blame, the people that made the decisions on how they should do things. But, yeah, it just didn't work out that... It could have been better. And I think Ultron, for example, had more personality, at least. Because this one was just, yeah, she was just, Oh, we are going to take over the world. And, yeah, I mean, she would bellow her lines and stuff like that. It was just, just didn't work. But, aside from that, I think that's my last real complaint that I had on the film. Otherwise, there was a lot of good character moments, a lot of interesting camaraderie in the in the team that they put together. Yeah, they gave Will Smith as Deadshot a lot to do. I mean, A, because he's a movie star, but B, just he, he handled it. He There was depth to that character, and there were times that I didn't like him, and then he'd win me over, and uh, I dug that. I thought that that was really neat. But I, I think every person that saw the movie, without exception, would say that the star of that movie was Harley Quinn. She stole that. Every scene she was in, there were moments where I was just like, holy crap, this is delightful. <laughs> and 
part of it was she allowed you to have fun because she was having fun. Yeah. And that is so necessary in a movie like this. You need somebody who's able to say, wow, we can, we have powers, or wow, we get to blow things up, or wow, isn't this great? Look at this tech that we have, or wow. Because, wow, none of us as normal people ever experience any of the things that these people are. And you need at least somebody who's an audience surrogate that's just like, wow, this is great. Hey, guys, do you realize what we're doing? And every once in a while in a movie, you'll get a character that's like that. For example, in Civil War... The Spider-Man character was that the whole time. Yeah. He's just in awe that he gets to hang out with these superheroes and get to do all these fun things. And Harley was in a way that way as well, but just way, way crazier. <laughs> right. Yeah, she she was really fun. Probably all the funny lines came from her. I think probably the best emotional moment from the movie came from her as well um, when for a moment her little facade slips away and and then everybody walks out and you see her put it right back on that was a really good moment but yeah she was she was you know it's funny because I, I know I was thinking about this just recently I know a guy I work with a guy who is almost like a Harley Quinn not crazy but he just lives life so much I don't know like more everything is so much more exciting to this guy and he's just you know he, he goes to a soccer game he's like oh oh oh, oh my god dude did you see that oh, 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 oh. you know he does that kind of stuff about everything he's like oh dude dude, dude i caught this fish did you see this fish that i caught this weekend it's freaking amazing you know everything that he experiences it's like he's on you know i don't know four levels above everybody else and um I'm kind of jealous sometimes of that guy. I mean, everybody kind of jokes about him and says that he's a little crazy and, you know, because he's above everybody's normal level or whatever. But sometimes I think, man, I wonder how much more fun, how much more joy this guy gets out of his life than I do. And, I mean, maybe that's what Harley Quinn is like, too. Maybe I'm jealous of her being crazy maybe it's nice I don't know sometimes I feel like maybe I'm on my way but uh, so far I haven't gotten there so anyways that's an aside but I did like uh, Harley Quinn a lot she was a great character and she's been in like animated films before but this is the first time I'm sure she's ever made a, a appearance on the big screen although hasn't she been in like flash or arrow or something like that where she comes walking in as dr harleen quinzel harleen quinzel uh not to my knowledge there there was the suicide squad episode of arrow and we don't see her but we do hear her voice and then i guess warner brothers put the kibosh on that which is strange because <laughs> arrow is basically a batman tv series um, I just strange that they'd be like, oh, hey, there, there, there are three things you can't do. And yeah, she was on that awful, awful Birds of Prey series as well. So we have seen live action Birds of Prey, Harley Quinn. But yeah, the, the if, if you don't know about it, then it's better not to know. OK, I guess I'll live on in ignorance. But uh, yeah, it just it, it's it was a really well done part. And Margot Robbie should be on Australian currency. So, you know, it's just, uh, they, they, they did, they did well there and inspired, I'm sure a whole, or it will inspire a whole generation of young girls. Yeah. It's interesting. I wonder how much more we'll see her character. Cause she's kind of a, I mean, she's Joker's girl. She's a Batman villain, I guess. So I don't think they're going anywhere with Batman, with Batfleck. They don't have plans for any Batfleck solo films, right? He's got a contract to to direct his own <clears throat> Batfleck movie. But, oh, really? So there is a Batfleck solo. But it hasn't got a, rela a release date, as far as I know. And 
there have been there's been talk about doing a, a solo Harley Quinn movie based just on how much how well this, this movie did. was anticipated. Because um, we might have to put up the windows for this last little bit. <sighs> I know it's hot, but it'll en enable us to be fast. I wouldn't be surprised to, if they rushed a Suicide Squad 2 into development just based on how phenomenally well this movie did. Yeah, it made a ton of money, this right? This was the third biggest movie opening of the year. This opened bigger than Deadpool. The only movies it opened smaller than were Batman v Superman and Civil War, the other two big superhero flicks that weren't X-Men <laughs> related, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if it drops off as sharply as Batman v Superman did. Yeah, considering the score it got on Rotten Tomatoes, a lot of people didn't like it, but... Uh... We, were, we were focusing on the positive. There were a few moments where I, it was just fun, and I found myself carried along by the narrative, and the characters were different enough um, and, and interacted in different ways that I, I enjoyed it. If the characters had all been like Katana, who friggin' sucked, <laughs> I would have been like, oh, you know what? This movie just dour and no fun. And, I, uh, and, and there are a bunch of movies that are like that, where all the characters are one note and either grating or you just hate them or they're only there to look cool and cut people up or shoot people. Oh, Katana was able to slice and dice with her sword and no blood ever came out. I, I was impressed by that. I guess it was a magical sword. It's yeah. a magical PG-13 sword. It's like a lightsaber. It just cauterizes as it yeah. cuts. But they were able to strike a balance of characters that were really dour, characters that were really macho, characters that were unpleasant, and then characters that were having fun and characters that had some kind of at least inner motivation there was a little bit of a pissing contest and, you know, Kenneth Mas Macho going on in this movie. But it could have been so much more. I mean, you and I have seen so many more movies where it's a bunch of guys in a room and each one has to be the alpha male. And they do that thing where, like, <laughs> the silverback gorilla behavior. And I I have no patience for that at all. <laughs> I guess because we've seen it in real life. But I just, yeah, I, I'm glad that there was, you know, for example, Captain Boomerang kind of a lame character but i thought J courtney did all right with it and you know he, he was amusing and he was like okay uh, he's just in it for himself he has no loyalty and he's like oh okay i'll i'll help for a little while and then he's like eh, i'm gonna take off i i responded to that he wasn't just one note to me yeah they did a really good job i thought of getting the care i mean there were some that had very little to do it seemed like killer croc had very little to do or say he Mostly just kind of growled. But here and there he would say words. I don't know if it was just too hard for the guy to speak in that <laughs> costume. That might be. But he looked cool. I, I I wondered, well, why just do that all with prosthetics? Why not do that as a CG character? But in retrospect, I, I think it was a, the wise way to go. Plus, it probably would have cost another $20 million to do him as a CG character. True. So. Just so that he could growl and not say anything anyways. We don't want to go too long. There's still some other things that I could say. But yeah, like you were saying, that the team uh, dynamic was interesting and fun. The people finding a way to come together. These characters that are all just evil characters finding team to matter to them. I responded to that. That could have been done a lot worse as well. Yeah, it could have been much more ham-handed. And there was a few times where things like that were done that way. But... Uh, for the most part, it was done well. There is definitely worse things you could do than go see this movie on a, like a Friday night or whatever. I liked it a lot more than I liked X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah, me too. And I'm certain X-Men Apocalypse hasn't got a 20-something on <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes. I, I just, I gotta wonder... Is it because I love the X-Men characters that I was harder on it? Is it because we've seen better X-Men movies that I was harder on it? Or was it just a turd? And, yeah, with this one, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt because, I, oh, I love the Batman universe or any of that stuff. I just... It wasn't trying to be one of those life-changing movies that you remember for the rest of your life. It was trying to be sort of a, a fun action buddy ensemble and i think it succeeded in that yeah 
So what's next? Is it Justice League that's next? We saw the Wonder trailer for next. Wonder Woman. So it's the next one? Yeah, there was a little coda with Affleck and uh, no, was... Amanda Waller that, that was setting up Justice League. Yeah. But because Wonder Woman is is set in World War One, there's no crossover there. Yeah, I can't really do that. I'm actually interested in seeing the Wonder Woman movie, too. I think it's just because it's Wonder Woman. I really like Wonder Woman. I want to see it done well. I hope it is. I really liked the bits of the trailer where you see Wonder Woman just kicking ass. For some reason, it was cool. Well, I, I thought that the glowing lasso Yeah, the glowing looked lasso cool. looked pretty neat. And I just wonder, I was like, have we not seen that before? And probably we haven't. Because the only way they could have done it in the past would have been with rotoscoping and and that cer- they certainly couldn't afford to do that in Linda Carter's day. Right. And we've never seen Wonder Woman in live action since then, have we? No, and other than whatever they did in the Batman vs. Superman movie. That, that was her... Wonder Woman's first appearance on the big screen was the Lego movie. Oh, somebody told me that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited for that one. So, I don't know. It's weird to be looking forward to DC movies. I don't know what to do. But well, they could still botch it. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. And we could talk about, even before Wonder Woman comes out, what you have to do in a Wonder Woman movie for it to work. And there's a really good chance that they do that something, that they do something wrong there. I mean, if, you, if you're trying to make a, a girl power movie, you can make something like Sucker Punch, which just doesn't work. Have you seen... No, I you, haven't seen Sucker Punch. You've never no. seen it. Well... There needs to be some kind of give and take and, and, and checks and balances. And yeah, seeing a whole bunch of women kill a whole bunch of dudes, I guess that works on a certain level. But you need there to be vulnerability. You need there to be humanity, something that speaks to the heart and not just the loins. And uh, I, I hope that they can pull that off in Wonder Woman. Yeah, it's interesting because Wonder Woman is not a fun character. She's like this really serious kind of Amazonian butt kicker kind of a person. And it appears as though the characters around her are going to be the ones that add, you know, the, the, she's the goddess and they're just the human beings. And they're, you know, the ones that say the funny stuff. And, you know, I've heard that Chris Pine really enjoyed his role being a damsel in distress <laughs> the whole way through. And uh, that'll be fun and interesting to see. We'll see how that goes. And hopefully they avoid that trouble that DC tends to fall into. The uh, overly serious 300 Man of Steel Watchmen kind of uh, thing. Just need to get rid of Zack Snyder, really. Yeah, well, that, that's very true. I, that's not for another eight months or so, Wonder Woman? I don't think yeah. it's till, like, early next year. But uh, surely there'll be other things between now and then well, we that got, uh, we can go see. we got uh, Star Wars, and we've got uh, Doctor Strange. Yeah. And probably something else that'll come up. Um. Uh, yeah, so final word on Suicide Squad. No, it wasn't the greatest movie I've ever seen. But boy, it was so far from the worst movie I've ever seen. Yeah. It's so much so that I would recommend, if you have any interest in seeing Suicide Squad, I would recommend that you go see yeah, it. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Like I said, there's definitely worse things you could do on a Friday night than going to see the Suicide Squad. And so I'll, there you go. I'll probably be doing those things this Friday night. <laughs> the worst things that you can do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, folks. So I've been Big Anklevich. And I've been Rich Outfield. And uh, thanks for listening to another That Gets My Go. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let us know what you thought if you want. Or you can just leave us alone. It's cool. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, no derivatives license. That means you can copy it, share it, and make paper dolls out of it. But you can't sell it or use it in your little voodoo rituals. I'm talking to you, sir. Remind me to talk about things I did like, because it sounds like I'm just complaining. Yeah. I say we talk about what we didn't like first, and then go on to the things that we did like. So I'm almost done. Okay, I am too. I think there's like one more thing that I want to complain about. Although, 
I don't know that in, I can complain enough about the tattoos. <laughs> You'd like it when what's his face is like that stuff all over your face and then wash off. 